assume that everything works and dear audience if everything is working for you guys uh like serkan is saying in the audience that connection is okay and i i assume you have you have heard us all the time both of us so uh i think that we are ready to go and and we have here janne lautanala i love the way ivan was uh ex- <laughs> saying your name just now <laughs> uh, i can't even repeat the way <laughs> it is so wonderful um we have had some fun with with the finnish names um um here and and Amanthia is saying and Eero is saying that everything is wor- working fine so i assume we are okay to go and and maria kajava also and, and sergey konstantinov still with us i heard janne that you have a few uh pressures with time so uh we'll we'll kind of start going on and then you'll drop out when you need to and dear audience please uh give us some great or even okay questions there are no stupid questions so keep them coming and uh we were just actually with sergey um kind of going to talk about a little bit of a bit of their microservices um security so we could take a few minutes of of talking about that um while waiting for any audience questions and then i will start um discussing with the, the others and mary i know you have at least some opinions on microservices security i am very sure of that uh so please join me in and janne you are you are welcome to also tell us how you have uh, handled security you had already a rate limit uh question coming in uh earlier so sergey yeah i was i was asking you um about the kind of how you had mitigated that issue of microservices security because sometimes there are these kind of shared libraries which handle the permissions and and some kind of shared way of handling the permissions but there are also these other ways like token based um identity being passed to the microservices and and also other ways so can you tell us anything about how you have solved this or what your thoughts were when you were designing it so the like what we tried to achieve and what i think we were able to do we we're trying to have the situation where one microservice is asking the another microservice to mm-hmm. make some operation it is always assumed that the permission was already granted by our authorization and authenticated proxy the logic while the permission was granted is hidden from the microservice itself Mm. It doesn't check. It's just checking that the service which is asking has the right signature. And by signature, I mean the entire request is signed. And what users make can request, what operation they are requesting, and so on. It's right. It's signed. It's signed. The signature mm. is correct. Yeah. And this particular like asking microservices is has the right to ask this thing. So we had some kind of like table which microservice is allowed to call which microservice, mm. and we have the like black box before them which checks what user is able to do. Yeah. Sometimes this checking is very complicated. Like we had specific microservices checking is there is there a right for this user a permission to make this request, but the ultimate goal for microservices is only check authenticity of request not the authorization of that request yeah yeah and that is a very good approach to it and, and and using kind of jot tokens and, and everything and and i i was just uh, confronting another um, a, a platform during the weekend where they sent out messages where their api keys had been potentially compromised because they are using just keys and not um open id connect and not any kind of token based um authentication and identity management and and that is super not secure to not do that but um going to janne next so what do you think where where are your kind of security concerns around the traffic information that you are sharing i mean you have public apis basically but is is there anything that you are not 
giving out publicly on, on the traffic information or that is very confidential and how you how you're handling that yeah there are but it, basically we have a slightly different approach for for that data so for example we are doing a huge amount of collaboration with uh, the Finnish defense forces police etc etc so all of the data that we are delivering through digital traffic is open data there's no restrictions or very little restrictions so the security aspect is much more straightforward and and we have a specific secret data sets for certain parties which we are handling a little bit separately so yeah. there's no fine-grained uh, access control requirement for our data currently so uh, basically we have postponed uh, that architectural discussions yeah. for that reason yeah so there is the problem of if, if like in um, in generally the data needs to be secured, for example, on a row or, or column level, if you think in database terms, or if, if it's microservices and, and you kind of have to keep them dist distant from each other, but still working together, <laughs> yeah. which is a challenging thing. So, Maria, what, what have you uh, been, been thinking and doing with, uh, you, you handle the autonomous car and, and traffic uh, lights and everything in your talk and I, I can imagine that there are some security concerns there uh, Yes, and not only security concerns, but privacy Concerns yes. for example if you take the photos From the car there might be people walking visible on the photos there might be license plates of other cars you oh. don't want to store this information, but you still need to first kind of run the prediction for the photo. So if you later want to verify that was this correct, you need to kind of blur the image so that you can't identify the actual person's mm -hmm. license plates. So this is something which actually is very important. And that's actually an interesting point that we actually came across with a joint project that we are doing with you and Vlad uh, recently that kind of when you have algorithms in your uh, and, and you're passing uh, your APIs are in, in a sense the gateway to the algorithms and you have this kind of privacy or otherwise sensible data and you have to was a sensitive sorry all data should be sensible but sensitive data and then you have to kind of uh, keep the very raw and very very um, kind of complete data set first to the algorithm even though you might not uh, be storing or sharing that kind of sensitive uh, raw data so that is an interesting thing how to how to kind of handle that have, has any of you thought about it or have to have to handle that kind of situation or anybody in the audience well, I can make some yeah. short or long speech. Uh, <laughs> short of the thing we are doing is, is like have all the internal algorithm, all the microservices to operate with anonymous IDs. Yeah. We never know the actual personal data at all. We're trying to avoid it at, at, at all costs. That makes uh, Having this data much less stressful since like you need to make one the following thing. You're hiding it behind the API. So you can access the photo if you pass yeah. the notification. And you exclude any bulk requests. So each endpoint which requests on the personal data is must be authorized and it could not do it as a bulk one. Like, you have some reason to require this personal data, so provide it. Why this microservice needs to access this personal data? That's the thing we have tried like, to implement in all of the our microservices. Mm. And, and that kind of anonymizing and pseudonymizing of the data is, is a very good approach to most cases, except when that data is exactly the data that you are you need for the analysis, like for example, license plates and stuff. But oh, there would be so many API related jokes and, and, and system related jokes about this. But let's just say that 
in one one of the real cases, I had to kind of make the decision and, and discuss with the teams that, that do, do Russians, Swedish and uh, Finnish customers fit into the same API? <laughs> because, I mean, we have this joke that do they fit into the same sauna, uh, but do they fit into the same API is, is also a question of how the data should be handled uh, and, and what are the data modes, but also about this kind of where the data can uh, be stored according to regulations. So. There are there are all kinds of things here, but we were talking about autonomous cars and autonomous uh, vehicles and and kind of um, a lot of different things with Jan and Maria earlier. So uh, I would like to open up a little bit of that discussion still uh, while waiting our our audience to maybe ask us a few questions. Um, audience, please, if you if you have any questions, now is your time. But about this autonomous traffic, so Janne, you mentioned earlier that you have uh, th there that there are levels for the yeah. autonomous traffic, and that there are not just cars that need to be in the kind of autonomous um, mobility thinking here. So, can you open up a little bit um, again about the kind of what are the different uh, kind of things that you need to consider with autonomous traffic, and then we can maybe expand to the APIs. And I will, dig in the meanwhile, some of the older questions that we have uh, that we haven't still answered. Sure. So I, I put into the chat window. There's actually a pretty good description of the autonomy levels. So mm -hmm. um, there are actually six levels of vehicle autonomy. Level zero being absolutely zero autonomy. Level mm -hmm. one being driver assistance. Uh, level two being partial driving automation. So basically, you can it can be, for example, this uh, um, uh, kind of line following assistance. So there, for example, the Teslas and some mm -hmm. even of the other brands already have this partial driving auto automation. Then. Uh, level three is the conditional driving automation. Uh, in certain cases, it's a kind of automated, full autonomous or automated driving, uh, but it re requires very specific uh, cases. Level four being high driving automation, and they are being explained here. And uh, level five is the kind of full driving automation. So basically, no no need for any driver uh, in the vehicle. So, of course, the complexity uh, increases while you go upper in the level of autonomy. So uh, it will be a gradual journey in, in most of the traffic modes. How do you get from the current levels, which are typically one or two, all the way to level five, even mm -hmm. depending whether that's even feasible in, in all the traffic modes. Yeah. So, Maria, you have experience about this autonomy and, and APIs from the cars, and you were already touching on the topic of, like, you need to understand if it's a traffic light of a, or a child. <laughs> so, uh, were there any specific kind of per performance or latency or other um, requirements because of that physical autonomy um, that you needed to deal with for the APIs? You actually need to have really, really small latency because mm. if you are detecting during the while driving, there are many steps to take the photo, upload the photo to the X or wherever you want to run the prediction and get actually back the result. And so that either the driver is reacting or if we have an autonomous driving, the car is automatically reacting. So this is so much more than what you typically kind of get in normal mm. API scenarios currently. Yeah. So I'm also kind of not skeptical, but it's <laughs> going to be many, many years before we even move forward into yeah. moving towards the self driving. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that we can't go gradually, step by step. Yeah. For example, yeah. wouldn't it be wonderful to when the cars would be collecting 
And for example, when you are driving outside in Lapland with the reindeers, <laughs> your car would actually detect that oh, there is a couple of reindeers on the road and this information would be flowing to other nearby cars who are approaching this mm. place. So I think partially things can be moving forward. Now, what about Sergey? I mean, I won't ask you when. When do you think you don't need drivers anymore in Yandex Taxi? That is, on the political side of things, like we we already discussed with Jan and, and Maria about the kind of societal impact. But what do you think? Like, are your APIs that you are developing are they anything to do with any level of autonomy, or kind of have you considered the possibilities of it? No, actually, Yandex had an autonomous vehicle development mm. like quite advanced but sorry i have i know nothing about the apis i would say that in my understanding of the things first we need to ensure the autonomy of the car it must be able to make some decisions maybe not complete but safe decisions without mm. access to APIs, except for the car Cars on, yes. That is the, the main point. Mm -hmm. All other things are like simply the insurance, in fact. Okay, you may like, make decisions and control center, but yeah. it, so it's the car, it's right passing right through tunnels, it's passing under underwater all tunnels, and so mm -hmm. it must be operating on like, mm -hmm. autonomous mode. So and and those are are real issues when when talking about physical objects like cars and and kind of uh, also the the kind of AI based decision making or any kind of autonomy uh, autonomy in the decision decision making. But actually, I have like I'm looking at the questions that came earlier, and and here are uh, questions for, for which were originally for Janne about the kind of CO2 and traffic data and, and, and tourism, tourism sector and, and do, uh, does traffic management Finland have that kind of traffic information and how are things like feedback uh, being discussed uh, that comes from the developers using those APIs. But I'm going to turn this question actually to Sergei because Mika already answered kind of from the kind of basic level. but. Sergey, when I mean you, you guys are operating also in Finland, and if you, I, I don't know if you are using these APIs that Traffic Management Finland is is providing, or do you think that uh, having data about you know everything from uh, charging stations or gas stations to kind of real time traffic information and and Janne can fill in the rest. Is that something that you think you could be using, or or you are using already? in Finland or some other countries? Well, actually, when we are entering the country, the first question is about maps and mapping information, mm. including traffic and so on. There are the charge stations, for, for instance. And we in Yandex have our mapping uh, department, Yandex Maps, and we always start, like, first we need to have decent map. Without that, there would be no, like, taxi. Because simply we have no advantage if we have no map. Like, what's the, the point of using the online service which could not like learn what distance between you and the car and how mm -hmm. many times you need to follow to pass this distance? So, answering the question, yes, we are collecting in our math department every information. We're gathering every information we have. We really like. uh, if there is some free information, we use it, of course. I don't know specifically about Finland, but we have lots of like uh, API interaction with governmental data about traffic. We have our own uh, like systems which uh, guess the traffic and even the forecast of the traffic, and that's, in my opinion, the crucial part of successful. Of mostly all real-time startups, autonomous cars, delivery startups, uh, like right hailing startups, food delivery startups, and so on. You need to have map and you mm. need it to yeah. be as accurate and as real-time as possible. Exactly. 
and and kind of the concept of map has changed a lot. So it's kind of like if you look at Google or Yandex Maps, it's, it's not just the kind of physical location and where are the roads, but it's it's more about like is this road going to work for me right now with the speed I want to drive in it. So Janne, um, we have like I, I would like if uh, if you have any opinions or, or thoughts about what you just heard from Sergey, but then we ha also have a, the next question from Duke, which you could start answering. So. Duka says that I would like to hear from all of you whether you are happy with the current state of standardization of transport APIs and where you see it going. So this is the, I think, last question that we have time to answer. But Janne, if you have any comments. Yes. Well, <coughs> not, not happy. So it, it's partially standardized, but not also Google Transport, uh, J, sorry, GTFS is, is available for um, for some parts of the public uh, transport data, we have NetX2, uh, which is slightly more advanced, but there's still room for improvement. And way too often, um, all the parties have different APIs and different data models and whatnot. So it, it, compared to many other industries, it's, it's just a mess. Um, mm -hmm. I, I sincerely hope that especially the kind of EU level standardization activities and, and need for collaboration results in better standardization. But uh, let's face, this is way more fragmented industry than many others, and it will take some time. Mm. And do you actually have like a lot of, uh, like is, is Yandex or some other of the global kind of, uh, and, and not, not only local operators, are they kind of a valid user group for your APIs? Or of what, course. What's the yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If they are utilizing or want to utilize traffic information from Finland, uh, mm. absolutely. So, Maria, what about you? What do you think about the current state of standardization of transport uh, APIs? It could be so much better. As yeah. one young were saying, that it's it's not at the level of what is in some other industries. Mm. And I think actually, there are so many different stakeholders, different viewpoints. Mass mobility as a service is one point. Then you have um, flying, freight, so different viewpoints. Yeah, you have this like kind of sub industries or, or like the different industries yes. that they are controlled differently. And of course, they have different data models completely. Yes. So you have IATA and, and in the kind of flight segment and you have a lot of different things going on so it's kind of a very loaded question but one we actually had to deal with already in the um, when the Finnish legislation was coming in and requiring those APIs because it was a, an interesting thing because we couldn't direct them too much and and still everybody wanted to know what what should the API look like <laughs> but uh, Sergey do you have an opinion on this well like I have dual opinions. <laughs> As a technical person, I would say that no intelligent person could say he's happy or she's happy with the APIs we have. But since I used to work with World Wide Web Consortium one back, back in 2015, I know that's incredibly hard task to make anything happen, to make people have any sort of contract regarding API. Yeah. I, I don't understand how it works at all, actually, but I'm happy it works. So, you know, I'm like, that's not an API metaphor, but I like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very frustrated that we already have like kilometers and miles. How so? <laughs> we we'll, we'll yeah, kilometers, wrong, miles, and different which things. Couldn't GPS agree on the simple <laughs> thing. Yes. But I'm still happy that at least we have seven days in a week <laughs> throughout all the globe. Yeah, that is approximately the only thing that people have agreed on. And, and the 24. Of course, the week starts sometimes on Sunday or yes. Monday. Yes. <laughs> but at least seven days. Yeah, don't it's a good thing. We started about how uh, vacations, Easter's, and everything else is calculated. I used to manage an HR system. But anyway, so that. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the question of, uh, well, of course, the, the kind of benefits of standardization 
are one thing, but the cost and the effort uh, taken take, uh, that it does take to actually achieve the level of standardization, that is a good thing uh, to always think about and kind of how big and how wide and how comprehensive that standard should be is a good question. So do we try to fit, you know, ships and airplanes and, and, and taxis and everything else into the same API? It's, it's kind of coming down to that question of Russian, Swedes and Finns in the same API. It's like, what's the, what's the use case? Is there a use case where all of these should work together? And is the use case on the kind of schedules or something or or vehicle types or something, or, or is it really in, in booking tickets or something else? So it's kind of taking the value proposition. I, I think that if Amanzio is, is still in the audience, he will love this uh, because that's kind of the common thing that we always talk about, but making sure that we talk about the same value proposition of, of the API when we are standardizing it is so kind of crucial because otherwise we get this kind of paralysis of of standardization that does not take anybody anywhere. But I thank you for uh, joining the Q&A and I thank, thank you the audience for listening to us and asking questions. And now we have a break until four o'clock and we'll actually continue on, on uh, stage two about uh, microservices. So continue from Sergei's topic, uh, the, it's, it's going to be about how to uh, how to avoid building a microservices death star so looking forward to that one but also more complex apis um not just traffic but healthcare where they have created a standard but what happened and what is really happening with that so stay tuned with the similar topics but different industry until the break uh, after the break